good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Melinda. Uh, on behalf of FOSI committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you here today and FOSI online talk series. I hope you enjoy your lunch and ready to hear the presentation. Amid this COVID-19 outbreak situation, hope everybody doing well. Stay at home and keep physical distancing. I would like to extend my gratitude to our sponsors, Noble Energy Resources and Geoscience Delta Underland for funding the Zoom platform. With us together, already joined the FOSI committee, Masriki, our General Secretary of FOSI. The rest will be joining soon. We're glad to inform you that we established the FOSI YouTube channel. We uploaded all the videos from previous talk already. Don't forget to subscribe and like the channel and please enjoy the video. And for sure, today's talk will be uploaded as well. I would like to thank you for joining us today for this special presentation on Eastern Indonesia, changing ideas and geological lessons. The registered participants is 550. And get ready to be excited. The presentation will cover the old changing ideas and new ideas in Eastern Indonesia area. Moving right along, it is now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. Really honored to have Professor Robert Hall. Currently, he is an emeritus professor at Southeast Asia Research Group, Royal Holloway University of London. Many thanks for sparing your time in weekend with us. I believe most of you know him very well, met him or maybe already have his useful presentation on Indonesia Tectonic. And the material for today's session has been sent to me. I will send it through chat room a bit later. So well, before I hand over to Robert Hall, please allow me to give you some rules in order to make this meeting running smoothly. I would like to get your attention for a moment. I recommend all participants to mute the audio and switch off your video during explanation from presenters to maintain a good connection. The presentation may be recorded for rescreening within the FOSI platforms. A Q&A chat box can be found in the icons panel, usually at the bottom of your screen. Enter your name for the committee to collect after the presentation. It will be answered live. Later on, you might turn on your audio and video to deliver your question to Robert Hall. And basically, Robert is fine if anyone would like to ask him in the middle of his presentation. Just put your name in the chat box and committee will notify Robert later on to answer the questions. So let's see how many questions arise later on. So well, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the talk and please welcome Robert Hall. Prof. Robert Hall, this is your turn. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, now, I've got to uh, see how to run this because this is my first experience of a big Zoom meeting. So now I'm gonna share the screen with you. Okay. And uh, I hope you will see my first slide now. Yes. And I'm just, okay, and I'm just moving all those little pictures of everybody okay. to the top of my screen so I can see my slides myself. So, um, good morning from me and a good afternoon from you to everybody. And thank you very much for this invitation to join this impressive program of presentations that you've had so far and I understand will continue um, and um, thank you I saw some names that I recognized in the little pictures on the side of the screen today I, I want to talk about Eastern Indonesia um, partly because it's an area that in which I started my career in Indonesia many years ago um, and so it's very close to my heart but also because I think that there's an awful lot to learn from this very unusual and interesting region that have application to many other parts of this region and many other parts of the world, of course, um, because it shows us things that we can see only in Eastern Indonesia. So hold on, I'm trying to move the slides on. Oh, there we go. Um, the area that I'm talking about is um, on the eastern, southeastern part of this whole region that you can see India, the Himalayas, Tibetan Plateau, Southeast Asia, and then down here in the southeast corner, we can see 
quite a complicated looking area of Eastern Indonesia. Um, I want to start very briefly by going back to some of the ideas that were prevalent when I started working in this region, because many of these ideas have changed. Um, we knew there were small ocean basins, we knew there were deep trenches. Um, this had been known for many, many years. Um, and plate tectonics, when uh, this concept began to take over at the end of the 1960s and early 70s, started to explain many of these features that previously didn't have really good explanations. And this ultimately led to explanations and interpretations of this region in terms of movements of small fragments of microcontinents, of collisions of various sorts. But in this region, which was very remote and very difficult to work in and still remains um, not heavily visited as it were, um, many of these uh, ideas developed based on very limited amounts of information, various interesting assumptions, uh, and many of these views stay with us uh, even at the present day. These figures illustrate some of the, um, the key features. On the left, uh, we see a diagram, which I've modified from Pygram and Pangabean, uh, which shows some of the microcontinental fragments that were interpreted in this region. Um, in the top right, we see a figure that comes adapted from one of Hamilton, Warren Hamilton's uh, diagrams, which showed his concept of how these small fragments had uh, become part of Southeast Asia. Um, and this model was named by Neville Hale, uh, the bacon slicer, and you can see why it was called that, because as the idea was, as Australia moved northwards, a big striped slip system took off these fragments off the northern edge of Australia and moved them into Southeast Asia. And this lower right diagram from Davidson shows um, some diagrams that are often illustrating, uh, often used to illustrate this region with these little microcontinents coming in and colliding and causing all of these collisions. Today we have other aspects of information, um, but one of the things that stays with us is the idea that we can break up this region into lots of little plates. And this in, in a way on the left is an extreme version of this. This is a widely reproduced diagram uh, showing what are interpreted to be plate boundaries in the region. And you can see all these little plates in this region. And locally you can see some of the velocities on those fragments that have been inferred from small numbers of, of um, uh, GPS measurements. And on the right hand diagram, you can see some uh, illustration of this in the Sulawesi region um, and very high rates of motion locally and lots and lots of fragments bounded by apparently plate boundaries. One of the things that's changed a lot, but when we first started working in this region, uh, the ages of many of the small ocean basins in this region were unknown. And this was a speculative paper by uh, Lee and McCabe, which showed that the band of basin was underlain by what was old Mesozoic crust, and then the Sulu BC was younger, and the Sulu Basin, Sulu Sea into the north was younger still. And people interpreted um, fragments of crust in this region. This is from Pygram Pangabean again, as being quite old ocean crust. It was thought to be Mesozoic, possibly Jurassic or Cretaceous. I put these diagrams in, they're just a selection of things that I could have chosen, really to illustrate something that until recently we didn't know. Um, and there was a lot of disagreement about what the nature of plate boundaries actually is in this region. And also surprisingly, perhaps in some ways, where they are. And you'll see each of these diagrams, which I'm not gonna dwell on, draws the boundaries in slightly different ways and interprets them in, in different ways. And still today, even here's a 2014 paper which shows a, um, a set of boundaries in here which are similar but locally different in position to many of the others. Uh, so what are these uh, features that we see? Now one of the things that I think is very important about this region is the way in which, um, in my view, we can learn about some of the processes that happen um, 
uh, during plate movements and during collisions and during um, subduction uh, from what's actually happening in this region. But in, in, in the same way, one of the things that's happened as um, plate tectonics developed was that ideas that were developed in other places, completely different tectonic settings, were adopted and have been used and continue to be used in Southeast Asia. For example, how you, uh, small ocean basins form. Typically, models are derived from the Atlantic margins. Subduction processes were inferred from many other parts of the world. Um, I just put in provenance analysis as one of the examples of um, how these ideas have been adopted. But in my view, many of these models, which are developed elsewhere, may not be appropriate for the Indonesian region. And I think that's something I want to highlight. Here's some examples that I've just put in just to illustrate that. Nowadays, um, there have been many detailed studies of the Atlantic um, margins, and um, we have these McKenzie type models that were initiated in the 1970s. Later on, people started applying different types of stretching models. Um, ultimately, these were attempts to explain the features of the Atlantic uh, margins, and the Atlantic margins were re widely regarded as sort of classic passive margins. We've discovered that some margins, uh, parts of the Atlantic margins are rich in magmatic activity, others are not. They're very wide, there's a whole wide zone of stretching, and in many cases, the stretching takes place over long periods of time. Here's some other features of the region. Uh, one of the early recognized features of plate tectonics was that um, ocean basins, the major ocean basins, had a very predictable age-depth relationship. And this is plotted on this curve here um, with a, a factor which allows fairly accurate prediction of what the age of the ocean floor would be from its depth. And there are good reasons for this because the lithosphere thickens with time, becomes dense and sinks and so on. But when we look in the Western Pacific, and this was about a, a diagram drawn initially for the Philippine Sea, we see that many of the ocean basins in the, in the Western Pacific are actually significantly deeper than their age would normally suggest. And in fact, I put on here, um, in addition to some points that were added by Inchberger in a paper in 2003, and I put on one of, uh, one of the values that we've got in this region, the Banda Sea basins are even deeper. So there are some interesting uh, features of this region that are unusual and different and not uh, typical of major ocean basins. Now here's something I definitely won't be talking about today, but I put in because this is another uh, type of idea that's been translated into Southeast Asia. The idea that we can recognize different terrains from their, uh, in this case, light mineral um, characteristics, and we can classify them in certain areas. Now, these models were developed in temperate North America. And in my view, they've got many problems in Southeast Asia where we've got tropical climate, we've got much higher humidity, possibly different erosion rates, uh, deeper weathering, etc. I'm not going to touch on that, but I put that in to illustrate where these ideas are coming from and perhaps need reconsideration. Now in the last 15 years, um, we've had an awful lot of very interesting and very useful new data. Um, and these observations of some of these new data challenge many of the previous ideas and the types of things we've um, based our new ideas on are particularly, in my view, very important are new field work, new field observations. We've had the advantage of GPS positioning devices, which means now in very difficult areas and difficult terrains, we now know much more exactly where we are. Um, we've also got satellite and radar imagery of the surface, uh, which has made major um, changes to what we see previously when we had heavy rainforest and air photographs only. Uh, much more difficult to see features. Um, and offshore, uh, we're now getting more 2D seismic, and in particular in eastern Indonesia, we've had some really interesting multi-beam bathymetry, which gives us very detailed images of the sea floor. Um, radiometric dating has improved very significantly in the last 20 years in terms of uh, the uh, 
uh, techniques that are available to us and, and the things that have been done. And we can also now see a great deal of information in the upper mantle beneath these areas. So we can start linking what we see across all levels to what we see deeper. And these have been, some of the findings have been very unexpected and I expect this to continue. This is Eastern Indonesia, the, the area that I'm primarily going to focus on um, is broadly in the center of this region. And um, even today, there are many parts of this region where we don't really have the detail that we would like to have um, in, in terms of understanding uh, tectonics. But what we do have, for example, this section that's labeled up as the Sarong Fault Zone here, the area of the North Banda Sea here, part of that region, many parts of the Saram Trough, etc., as we'll see. We've now got very detailed uh, multi-beam bathymetry, which adds to what we can see on land and improve our knowledge dramatically. Now in the background, this is something I still think is important. I'm coming towards the end of my fieldwork career. <laughs> Um, and of course, COVID has made things a great deal more difficult um, and things are going to be difficult in the future. But in my view, there is still um, a great need for new observations in the field, especially now we can locate ourselves and we can use satellite and radar imagery to aid our interpretations. Um, the sort of information we've got is summarized on a couple of these two diagrams and I'm also, uh, I've highlighted uh, companies who have provided uh, parts of this data to us over many years, which has been immensely valuable. And what we can see on these diagrams are on land. In this case, these are shuttle radar images of topography where we can see detailed features that previously were not so visible or were unknown. And offshore, we've now got in these areas, you can see uh, very detailed images, which actually in some cases are higher resolution even than satellite imagery. Um, and now we can see, for example, some of those arguments about where tectonic boundaries were and are can be resolved by looking at some of this imagery of the seabed and imagery of land, etc. So those have been useful. Here are a few things that I'm going to touch on at different stages, but I just put this to illustrate. All of these figures I've taken here are rocks that were often assumed uh, whose ages were often assumed but not directly known by any means and in the last few years in some of these in most of these areas that i've illustrated here are areas where we've sampled and now dated and we found that many of the previously untested assumptions about ages um, needed reconsideration and in addition to that of course the field work provides the basis for uh, various laboratory studies i've just put in a few slides here of various things that we've been doing. We've had the opportunity to do zircon dating, uranium, uh, uranium lead dating, of zircons giving us very precise ages. Some of this work was carried out in Australia over here. Uh, we've got labs here in Germany where we've been looking at um, sediments um, uh, using cathode luminescence microprobe studies and so on. These just illustrate the range of things that the new field uh, samples provided us with. So let me now turn to just a very brief background to the history of this region. Um, what we know, of course, is that this region grew gradually. We're still arguing about many of the features that we see in this region, and this is just an interpretation of the end Triassic um, as a result of some of our work. But basically, I think everybody does agree that fragments that are now in Southeast Asia separated from uh, this large Gondwana continent down here at different ways uh, and were added on uh, by uh, various collisional processes accompanied by subduction over long periods. And this one, I've just put this one in to illustrate, I'm only going to let this run once. You can, I've put the animation in as part of the material associated with this talk, but it's available already. What this shows is a, my interpretation um, of how fragments have drifted away. Uh, we see India moving now at the moment northwards to collide with Asia. Um, and we now see in the later stages of this development, um, Australia moving northwards and various collisions going on in Southeast Asia. I'm only going to let that run once because I just want to illustrate the background to the region there. 
but essentially what the, the key features of this um, history are that Australian fragments or Gondwana fragments, uh, whichever you like to call them, rifted away from various parts of the Australian margin. And there's still some um, discussion about exactly where they were and when they moved um, and so on, arrived in Southeast Asia and uh, were progressively added. Um, and my point, the point I want to make here is that what we might call loosely Australian crust was present in this region, um, in the Cretaceous certainly, um, and long before the collision that I'm mainly going to focus on today in Eastern Indonesia, which began in the early Miocene. So we've got fragments of continental crust in that region. And of course, one of the most important features of this whole Southeast Asia region, in particular in Indonesia, um, is the fact that it's underlain by fragments of crust which arrived at different times, uh, which have different characters, and which were added together in various ways. And this is an interpretation of this region. And the yellow part is the bit I'm going to focus on mainly today, which is the arrival of continental crust that took place from the early Neogene onwards. So we've got this complicated region, and in many cases, I, I, this diagram of course is in a sense a work in progress and ideas are changing, new information is being collected and, and so on. These I expect these to change. Um, but essentially, uh, the important points that I want to raise by the time we get to the, um, the end of the Paleogene, just before the collision that we're, uh, I'm going to focus on mainly today, we had a very complicated crustal structure in this area of Southeast Asia here, which includes Java, parts of Sulawesi, Borneo, etc. And then to the south of that region uh, and to the north of Australia down here, uh, we have um, an embayment, the Banda embayment, which is old oceanic crust. As we go um, to the west, to the south of Java, the ocean crust was younger. And then to the north of Australia, we had crust which has now disappeared or largely disappeared, um, which was being subducted beneath various Pacific arcs um, to the north. And at the beginning of the Neogene, this continental crust that formed this spur, the Sula spur, began to collide in Sulawesi. So in a way, and I think this is important, Subduction is the key to understanding Eastern Indonesia geology. Um, and as we go on, some of our ideas about subduction have been changing. So let me turn to one important issue, which is um, another one of these topics that remains um, somewhat controversial. And I've summarized some key points here. Based on the literature, here are some widely held beliefs which are commonly said uh, and widely believed. Initiating new subduction zones is apparently very difficult. And this a paper by Dan McKenzie in the 1970s first discussed initiation of subduction and he said this was a very difficult uh, thing and we couldn't answer it by direct observation. And this view that we can't see subduction being initiated is still widely held today. And here's a, an example from a numerical modeler um, Korea, um, 2010, says um, the absence of places where you can actually see where subduction is starting. And very often, and this has become uh, almost um, uh, the most important, in a sense, assertion that is widely accepted now, is that the West Pacific is the best place to, um, to define a model. And Bob Stern, among others, has been very important in, in studying the ease of bone system and the the eastern edge of the Philippine Sea Plate and talking about subduction initiation that occurred there 50 million years ago. Well, in my view, subduction initiation is not that difficult to observe. We can see it in eastern Indonesia, which is what I want to illustrate today. Around the Western Pacific, there are numerous young subduction zones. Nearly all of the ones you can see on this figure here are young. Um, in other words, they initiated in the Miocene or later. Uh, we go from the Manila Trench, the Philippine 
trench over here, the Cotabato Trench, the North Sulawesi Trench, uh, the system that's going down under Halmere. We don't actually see the trench at the moment uh, because that's disappeared in the collision. And then, of course, the Banda system. So um, if subduction is actually somewhat difficult to start, how come it starts so often in this region in the Western Pacific? It seems to start here quite easily. There are two ways in which subduction has started in this region. The first one is what I call the easy way. Um, and that's, and the Banda system is an example of this. And this is subduction, which is initiated by um, basically propagating an existing subduction zone into another area. It just grows into that area at some particular time. And the Banda example is uh, one example of that. This is a plasticine model to try and illustrate for you the three dimensional features. And this is a, a situation about 30 million years ago, shown on this map in the top right, which is Australia colored in pink and red, continental crust here. Uh, we've got the Banda embayment within that, which you can see in the plasticine as being blue. This is all moving northwards as a single plate, Australia, if you like, and it's going down under the Philippine Sea here, and it's going down under Southeast Asia here, beneath Java. And at the Java Trench, we have a long-lived subduction system, which had started probably in the Eocene. Uh, and that subduction slab, subducted slab, was hanging in the mantle beneath Java. But there was no subduction in the Banda embayment. But what we see as that collision proceeds is that that Java Trench was able to propagate and grow into the Banda region. And to illustrate that, I've got two tomographic slices here. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time explaining these diagrams, except to say the blue is interpreted to be subducted, high velocity, um, cold lithosphere. So we're seeing a subduction zone. On the left diagram, we're seeing the subduction of the Java slab. And you can see that goes right down into the lower mantle. So there's hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of slab there, uh, keeping subduction going probably. And the diagram in the middle shows that long slab going down under uh, Lombok and uh, Sumbawa here, um, deep into the lower mantle. And the profile is the one we see on the left. On the right, on the other hand, if we go further east, the slab doesn't go down into the lower mantle. It flattens out at the base of the upper mantle. The slab descends as a subducted slab, but it flattens out. And that's typical of actually subduction rollback. And that form that we're seeing there led to the formation of the Banda Arc. And of course, this is the Banda Arc. I'm sure all the people watching this uh, um, presentation will be familiar with the Banda Arc and the islands in it. But I'll just point out the main features, Sulawesi here, Saram here in the northern part of the arc, and then the large island of Timor on the south side. I'm going to focus much of what I'm going to say uh, this morning, uh, this evening, on this area in the north of this diagram here. Uh, the Banda Arc give, uh, gets its name from Banda Api, of course, which is still an active um, volcano. And here's uh, Banda Api and some of the uh, young uh, basaltic lava flows on there. Um, all of the activity in this region is very young. Nearly all the uh, igneous rock ages we have from this region are less than 10 million years old. And of course, many of these volcanoes that you can see shown in red on this diagram are active today. Now, if we look across the Banda region, and if you look at many diagrams showing this region, people focus on the fact that Australia is moving northwards, approximately. Um, and there's a collision. And so therefore there's um, an obvious, um, and in a way, temptation to look at this um, region in north-south profiles. And if we look at north-south profiles, we see the slab, as I've mentioned, this is just to the, the west of Timor, the, the top section on the left here. We can see the slab going down nearly to the base of the upper mantle and then flattening out underneath um, the Banda Seas. Now, as we go further to the uh, east, and this is a section I've chosen that actually goes um, almost across Saram, as you can see here, 
um, between Timor and, and Saram, the slab does something very strange. It goes down, which is typical of this subduction, but then it appears to go up again, which is extremely unusual. And this feature has been noted, but not really explained uh, for many years. Interestingly, if we draw sections in a different direction, and you'll see the diagram on the right hand side, lower right here, is a section drawn almost east west from uh, um, the Aru Islands over here to just crossing uh, just south of Sulawesi. We see a subducting slab very clearly again, uh, but this time the slab appears to be dipping westwards and then again it flattens out. So, which of these? diagram should we focus on? Should we focus on the north-south section or the east-west section? They both show subduction, but if you just concentrate in 2D, they show it apparently in different directions. And the reason for this is because the slab has this three-dimensional shape, um, which is, has been known for many years in terms of the Benioff zone contours, the contours on the earthquakes, uh, which show the, the Bandar arc curving round almost through 180 degrees. Um, and the volcanic arc almost going the whole distance, not quite as far, um, but curves round similarly. And the ultimate 3D shape of this is, um, some people look at it uh, in terms of what is the shape of a half a bathtub, as it were. Um, other people have drawn the analogy of a boat going eastwards um, with the prow of the boat going into the curved section. And that slab shape, of this strange boat shape uh, prow, if you like, here, is now interpreted as the result of subduction rollback, which I shall just remind you about in a moment, uh, what we mean by rollback. So that slab is rolling back into that embayment, the Bandra embayment. And this is what we mean by subduction rollback. I saw this was mentioned using one of my slides in an earlier presentation in FOSI, so some of you will have seen this diagram before, um, which I drew just to illustrate the main features. Um, here's a slab that's subducting. We won't worry about how it started at this time, but there's a slab subducting into the lithosphere. And we tend to focus in these sorts of diagrams on the relative movement of the two plates towards one another. The subducting plate moves northwards in this case, or moves, um, sorry, to the, to the left. Um, and as it descends under the slab here, um, the upper plate, we get an arc formed, we get melting of the mantle wedge and magmatism. But we can look at this subduction system in a completely different way. Um, instead of focusing on relative movements of the plates towards one another, we can focus on the actual movement of the slab being subducted. And the forces acting on the slab being subducted are primarily gravitational. So in other words, we can look at this slab as though it's sinking. And therefore, with time, and I've drawn two stages in this here on the lower diagram. The slab sinks into the mantle, um, which is where it wants to go because of its uh, relatively high um, density, uh, and it therefore um, causes the hinge, the subduction hinge, to move backwards towards the subducting plate. And this is what we mean by rollback. And if that occurs, we might expect the arc to move as well during that interval. And we also expect other features to occur, such as new mantle has to come in in some way into this area to fill the space that's been created. But one of the most important features is that we see at the surface is the plate itself also extends to fill the space that's being created as that hinge rolls back. And so what we see, and this is actually a common feature of many arcs, is we see extension. Now, this is somewhat counterintuitive for many people because they tend to think of these two plates as converging and therefore the result of this convergence as being compression or deformation. And the point I want to emphasize is that in many cases this is not compressional, it's extensional, it's quite the opposite of what the sort of conventional thinking about subduction leads to. And although I um, I, I don't think I've quite succeeded in my plastic model in, in conveying this. What I've tried to show here is that if we had subduction rollback into the Bandar embayment, it requires, first of all, a tear to occur on the north side of the embayment in this case, which we'll discuss where that is in a while to come. But as a result of the way in which this slab rolls back, we can see this depression 
forming in the center of the plate. And now we can see why we get this apparent profile if we go north-south, which causes the slab to appear to go down and then go up again. It's because the three-dimensional form of this slab during rollback is actually depressing it to form that sort of boat-shaped area with a tear on the north side and a subduction zone on the south side. And this little animation here is one that illustrates the process in map view. And I want to draw attention to a few features of this. This is the Sula spur moving northwards. There's the Bandar embayment to the south of it, shaded in green. And as that moves northward, we start getting a lot of complexity in Sulawesi, which we're gradually unraveling, but still far from understanding. We see small ocean basins open up within this region. This is the North Banda Basin, now the South Banda Basin. And these are all consequences of this rollback. I'm gonna stop this a couple of times during the process here. So there's the Sula Spur moving northwards towards this subduction zone under the North Sulawesi Arc and then various arcs in the Philippines, Halmahira over here. And then at around 24, 23 million years ago, approximately, we had a collision uh, the spur, extended spur, starts to collide with the arc, in this case in North Sulawesi, and we get uh, collisional deformation in this region, uh, which is not very well recorded in Sulawesi, but is recorded to some extent, with uplift of ophiolitic rocks and erosion of these, and so it's clearly some sort of orogenic system was developed in that region early in the Miocene. And then as that proceeded, let's just watch the Java Trench for a moment, subduction is still continuing. Australia and the Spur and the Banda Embayment are continuing to move northwards. The slab is being subducted under Java here at the Java Trench. And then as we go northwards, that subduction zone, sorry, as we go forward in time, that subduction zone gradually grows and propagates towards the east-southeast into this embayment. And for the first time, the Banda embayment starts to be subducted. Now, this is very old lithosphere here, probably almost the oldest on the surface of the globe. Um, it's probably Jurassic, um, and uh, it was probably Jurassic, and therefore, once it gets involved in this subduction, it really does want to sink into the mantle, and that's what it does. So we see the process of rollback. Now, the important thing to emphasize here is that although this whole system is moving northwards, or roughly northeastwards in, in my reconstruction here, and subduction is continuing under Java in that way, the actual subduction direction in the Banda embayment is not towards the north, it's roughly towards the East southeast over here. And so we're rolling back in the northward moving Australian plate in a different direction. And what that leads to is um, fragmentation. As that subduction system rolls back, it causes fragmentation of the spur, which opens up a series of small ocean basins. Here's the Banda, North Banda Basin, and then later on the South Banda Basin, and the continental fragments in this region have been extended as that rollback continued. So this region here, uh, although it's a convergent system and we're seeing subduction, it actually is responding in a way that leads to massive extension, really massive extension. It fragments the continental crust, it takes bits of it into the forearc, it leaves bits of it in the middle of the Banda Sea, and it leaves fragments of it, Sula Spur, Sulawesi, and parts still in the bird's head. Okay, so that's the situation that developed. And let's now move on. So that's one way of subduction developing, and I'm going to return to that uh, process that occurred as a consequence uh, in a little while. But there's a, what, another way in which subduction developed in eastern Indonesia, and I, my view is developing in other parts of, of the Western Pacific at the present day. And this is what I've called the difficult way. Uh, in this case, the subduction zones didn't grow from pre-existing subduction zones, they started fresh, and they're not connected even today. 
And here's some examples of these. And these are examples where I believe you can see subduction initiating. And the one I've labeled as number one, in my view, is the earliest stage of the beginning of uh, subduction developing. The Tolo region here, the Tolo thrust, we'll touch on uh, the other side of the North Banda Basin, is uh, a little bit further advanced. The Cotabato system up here on the north side of the Celebes Sea, going down under Mindanao, is one that's got a little bit further in the process. And then we've got the North Sulawesi Trench here. I'm going to talk about all of these. The oldest one is probably the Philippine Trench here, which still also dies out towards the south, but I'm not going to talk about that one today. But these are progressive stages in the development of subduction. And this is what we can observe if we look around subduction, uh, small young subduction zones around the Western Pacific. We see that all the neogene subduction zones developed at the edges of these small ocean basins. And these were places where there was major topographic discontinuities, where the crust changes thickness dramatically. And I'll emphasize that point in a few moments with some values. Typically, I believe that subduction starts at a point and when you start looking at these subduction zones, you commonly find there's a point you can identify in the middle of a growing subduction system, which is probably where it started. The actual age of the ocean crust being subducted seems unimportant. We used to think that the older ocean crust was more likely to subduct and the younger crust was not. That doesn't really seem to be the case. And you can start subduction without having any compression at all. And what we see in Southeast Asia, in my view, is numerous subduction zones that are developing, which are not joined up. And here's a, a cartoon, a series of cartoons and some crustal profiles, which are very, very simplified to illustrate the key points that I uh, want to emphasize in the way in which it develops. And I've, I've, I've basically made these a little bit more extreme to make my point here, but what I'm showing here is that in the corner of this ocean basin, which is marked in blue here, against a pink area, which is either a continent or um, a, a, an older arc crust here, we have a little point, which I've exaggerated here. And that's where subduction initiates. And we've got a topographic discontinuity at the edge of this ocean basin, where we go from the deep ocean crust on one side, the topic topographically elevated continental crust on the other side and I've just put two layers in red there to illustrate the upper and the lower crust which are um, rheologically somewhat different from one another. Subduction initially starts by actually extending the crust over this point where it collapses, collapses on uh, these, at these topographic discontinuities, it collapses over and therefore it starts to depress the corner of the ocean basin. And that process of extension continues and we gradually get larger and larger involvement of the crust uh, at deeper and deeper levels, uh, subsiding and moving over the adjacent ocean crust and effectively loading it. And now we're getting a bit of what I've labeled in here as a subduction symbol. It's beginning to look like a subduction zone. And with time, once that slab gets down to a certain depth, it turns into eclogite at depth, which increases its density, increases its wish to subside further, and therefore it sinks further. It brings in a longer and longer length of ocean lithosphere, which laterally grows to the, in this case on this diagram, to the north and to the south. And we eventually get to a true subduction system, which by then has got the slab hanging in the mantle, and that's when it can really start to roll back in the way in which I showed a few moments ago. And here's a, um, an analog model showing exactly this. Um, this is a model involving fluids. They've used in this model here, uh, one fluid to represent the mantle, and then another fluid to represent the lower crust and a different uh, fluid to represent the upper crust. And uh, essentially this is hold back, held back by this barrier they allow the barrier to be removed, which allows then the topographically higher crust to start extending uh, where it was previously held back by this barrier. And these diagrams on the right illustrate the progressive um, uh, 
uh, movement of this crust which extends over the adjacent oceanic area with time and causes a subduction zone to develop. And that simple analog model, I believe, actually is exactly what we're seeing in different parts of eastern Indonesia. Here's what, in my view, is the place where we can see the earliest stages of subduction. This is the North Banda Sea, and we now have a lot of detail of the thymetry in this area, so we know a great deal more about the morphology of this ocean basin, and that we know from radar images, and we know from obviously um, regular mapping where the coastline is up here. This is the um, part of the Sura Islands, this is Mangoli, um, and there's the coast uh, there, as you can see, uh, just below this uh, these mountainous area, which is more than a thousand meters high. And then we descend into the uh, ocean basin, and the average depth of the North Banda Sea is 4,800 meters. That's a lot deeper than its age would suggest it ought to be if it was a regular normal ocean basin, as I mentioned at the beginning. So this already is a deep basin. Um, but in the corner over here, this area I call the Sula Deep, it's 5,800 metres deep. It's 1,000 metres already deeper. And what we see in this corner is very important. So there's a, a simplified schematic of this region. Um, Along the south edge of Mongolia and Taliabu, the Sura Islands, we see a series of normal faults which are downthrown to the south. And then very rapidly we cross into an area of ocean crust. And then in that corner there, the top uh, northeast corner of the North Banda Sea, we have the Sula Deep. Uh, and what we see in this area, this corner is very interesting. I hope you can see some of these features in the morphology. But what these features look like in this region are massive failures. We see slumping, we see um, mass flow um, features coming down here. And this is a very, very narrow continent ocean boundary. From the, uh, the edge of the, um, the, the, the margin here, the coastline up here, to the deep area here, is less than 40 kilometers. It varies in width between about 40 kilometers and about 25 kilometers. That is very, very narrow. It's not like an Atlantic margin where you can't actually even tell the slope. If somebody dropped you on an Atlantic margin and told you to walk up towards the land, you wouldn't know which way to go because the slope is so gentle. Here, the slope is very, very deep. You wouldn't have any problems knowing which way to walk if you wanted to get to land. And in my view, this is the first stage of initiation of subduction zone. These feet, these, at this corner, the crust is failing into this area. We've got these mass flow complexes depressing the basin floor, and they've already depressed it by one kilometer below its normal deep. If we cross to the other side of the North Banda Sea, it's even deeper. We've got a corner here, which is um, 6,400 meters deep. We've got another corner here. The northern part of the Banda Basin, we've got this multi beam bathymetry. Down in the south area here, we haven't got the detail of bathymetry, unfortunately. So I can't map out the true form of the Tolo Deep as accurately as I would like, but I believe it's quite probable that these two deep areas join up. So this one is nearly a kilometer even further deeper than the Sula Deep um, up here. And this is linked to the Matano Fault System, which goes on land. And what's happening here, as you'll see in a moment, is that this area that I've shown in gray is extending, it's failing and extending across the ocean crust of the northern band of the sea, and it's forming now a thrust front over here, the Tolu Trough, um, and we're depressing the slab even further. And this is what we see on a seismic line across there. The seismic line is near, near to the Matano Fault here, approximately parallel to it, so it's almost in the direction perpendicular to the direction of extension. And what we see in here is a very, very major uh, discontinuity, which I interpret to be a significant detachment here, probably about two or three kilometers depth, depending on the velocities we use for the upper crust here. And this is extending and it's flowing outwards over. And at the south, um, or sorry, the southeast end of, of this uh, cross section, we see a thrusted area 
which is thrusting onto the ocean crust and depressing it. So this is, if you like, a mega landslide. It's exactly the same sort of feature you would see on any landslide on land, extension at the back, thrusting at the toe, and the whole thing is being translated, in this case, over the ocean crust and loading it now to a depth of 6,400 meters. Now I'm gonna to move to the Cotabato Trench because in my view, this is an example of a trench that's got a bit further in its development. And what we see in the Cotabato Trench on the right-hand diagram, you can see the trace of the trench. Its deepest part is right in the middle of the trench. It comes from the coast of Mindanao up here in the north. It, sorry, it can be followed um, southwards and then it curves round into this deep area shown in purple color on the left-hand diagram where it's 5,500 meters deep. And then the trench continues and dies out to the south. And it literally does die out both at its south end and its north end, and there's no continuity. And this part, the deepest part of the trench is in the middle. And that in my view is the place where it developed. And if we go towards Mindanao, uh, a distance of a few tens of kilometers, we see major extensional faulting, which I've simplified here to one extensional fault. And these are cross sections based on 2D seismic across this area. They're drawn at different scales. Uh, and I've put a vertical exaggeration on both of these just so we can see the key features. But my point, the points I want to make here is that once again, we see a big detachment within the crust, a depth of two or three kilometers, um, that there's thrusting at the front and there's extension at the back. And both of these show this. So this once again is a sort of mega landslide, if you like, except that it's several kilometers thick. It's sliding off at the edge of a small ocean basin. It's depressing the ocean crust at the edge and it's initiating a subduction zone, which in this case, the slab is now getting on for depth of not quite a hundred kilometers. Now, the Celebes Sea, the North Sulawesi Trench, is a trench system that has gone even further. And here we have a slab that now is much deeper than anything we've seen in the other ones. Uh, and this has been commonly been interpreted as a simple system in which there's been a rigid um, rotation of uh, a region here, a bounded on the uh, west side by the Palu Koro Fault and by uh, rotation about a point. Now, this has been suggested by paleomagnetism. It's been suggested by rates of movement on the Palo Koro, Koro Fault, and it's been suggested based on some seismicity. But if you look carefully at the seismicity, it doesn't really fit this type of rigid rotation model. And what we see is that although the trench can be traced along from um, east to west. It's not such a marked feature as in many other areas, but it's very deep. In the central part, it's 5,500 meters. And I want to draw your attention once again to the fact that the deepest part of this area is in the middle of the subduction system. And when we look at the seismicity in this area, what we see, in fact, is that the deepest part where the slab can be recognized is right in the center, almost south, due south of the bit that's deepest in the trench. To the north. And the slab shape is actually more like this. This is, I've colored in green here, the area of the slab that's in the mantle. And I put on the Benioff zone contours as I interpret them to be. And you'll see that when we get to the western end of this subducting slab, that the slab length is shorter and shorter. In other words, this is not what we would expect from a rigid rotation model, because as we go westwards, with the rigid rotation, we would expect the slab length being subducted to be greatest up against the Palo Coro Fault. And that's not what we observe. Now, my interpretation of that is that on the left-hand diagram, you can see the interpretation. On the right-hand diagram, you can see the present, is that subduction initiated at a point, uh, and we've had relative motion in here. So this is its position where it was perhaps relative to the east arm, not the north arm, which is rotated in different ways. The subduction has, the system has lengthened with time. So at six million years, it was approximately there, four million years there, and at two million years there. We now see at the 
Western End, two major faults, one of which I call the Tamburana Fault, the other one which is the well-known Palukoro Fault, which is the place where it's most active at the present day. And the slab length has increased um, as we've moved um, towards the west, uh, and it's now deepest in the central part. And in my, in my view, the Palukoro Fault probably is only a couple of million years old because it's the most recent fault here. Now what we see as a consequence of this slab um, hinge rolling back to its present position is that um, we've got an elevated area in the north arm but interestingly completely free of active volcanoes until we come to the very easternmost end of the north arm um, and then we've got Gorontalo Bay separating the north arm and the east arm and Gorontalo Bay is um, at its central part deepest is about two kilometers deep water and in the middle of the bay we've got these interesting features which in fact are carbonate reefs and those reefs can be seen in profiles these are a couple of profiles going across um, Gorontalo Bay um, these are images that I haven't located precisely but this is the central part of the bay here two kilometers water depth and we can see these interesting features which are uh, gradually less and less deep as you go, in this case, this is a profile running roughly north-south, as we go roughly northwards, the pinnacles, which these are, are closer and closer to the surface, uh, to the seabed. They're completely emergent, despite the fact quite a lot of sediment is going into Corontalo Bay. And this is what these look like. These are those pinnacle reefs that I just showed you. And pinnacle reefs, of course, are carbonate reefs where as the area subsides, um, commonly the subsidence rate becomes too excessive for the whole reef to keep pace and the organisms tend to move to a position where they can locally grow fast enough to keep pace with subsidence and therefore all the carbonate growth occurs in one place. Now the important point here about these pinnacles is that the tops of the pinnacles, when they formed, were at sea level because this is where those carbonate reef forming organisms all live within 100 meters uh, typically of the sea surface. So when we see pinnacles now down at two kilometers we know that sea level has dropped in that area from um, or relative sea level has changed from what was once a position of zero to now a depth of a couple of kilometers. And in the center of Gorontalo Bay we see this really fascinating reef complex which is typical of a big carbonate reef uh, which started to subside rapidly and has now got these tall pinnacles around its edges as it subsided and finally it couldn't keep pace any longer the reef died and that reef now is down at water depths of um, about 500 meters at the tops of the, the shallowest pinnacles in that thing and the base of that is down at one and a half kilometers and the point about this is, of course, is that those areas, the base where the carbonate reef started to form, when they formed, were at sea level. And my inference is that that was about two to three million years ago, for reasons that you'll see in a moment. So as rollback has proceeded, this is what's happened in the continental crust, uh, as it were, in the extending region, uh, which is extending to fill the space, which I mentioned as rollback occurs. First of all, we get these core complexes forming. And sometimes we see within the center of the uh, core complexes, magmatism. And this cartoon on the right illustrates the form in an exaggerated way of what this core complex would, like, uh, would be like. As we unload it by removing the upper crust, the crust bows upwards. So we see at the surface relatively deep crustal rocks, sometimes with melts in them, below the big detachment fault. And that detachment fault can be traced through, in this case, in my view, perhaps down to the Moho, or perhaps somewhere in the uh, deep crust, um, as that extension proceeds. And in the place where the crust is now thinnest, where we're taking the thinned upper crust over the thinned lower crust, we see a subsiding area. So right up against this area of the core complex, we see this subsided basin. And although we don't see this yet in the Sulawesi region, I think we certainly see it in Saram, we can even exhume the mantle. 
in places during this process of extension. And so the offshore manifestation of the extension is what I just showed you with these pinnacle reefs, subsided areas um, with a reef complex in the center of the bay and a very thick sequence of sediments in there. So we've got subsidence and in my view, these areas that were reefs that have subsided uh, very recently are above a major detachment, which I'm interpreting on there. And if we go to the south of that on land, that detachment comes on land and it can be traced up this surface, which is um, just to the east of Posso. This smooth surface is the detachment surface of this major structure. And this we're looking at a profile of what is an active metamorphic core complex, which has been exhumed in the past couple of million years. And that's what we see in that area. Um, if we continued on that north-south line there, as I just showed you, this detachment here running from north to south is running across here. And this is one of the core complexes which is being exhumed. And the dimension of this core complex from north to south is approximately 90 kilometers. And if we take the GPS measured velocities in that area, which interestingly are almost parallel to the direction of extension that we're observing, those velocities that have been recorded from um, GPS measurements in the last few years here, are showing rates of about um, 45 kilometers per million years. In other words, you could exhume this attachment surface here in two million years. And in the area to the north of the core complexes, that's the, the area that says PO there, is the Posso area, um, we see um, two small um, depositional areas, the south of the Lalanga Ridge here, which is where those um, central reef complexes were, um, is um, a, um, a small basin filled with sediment. And then to the north, there's even thicker sediment basins which terminate very abruptly um, at their western end on this Tamburana Fault. And the fault activity has now moved to the Palo Coro Fault, which of course is still active today. It's active today and these multi-beam images and satellite radar images. On the right hand side, you can see the expression of this fault on land, which is remarkable. It's a beautiful structure. If it weren't so um, devastating, uh, we could admire it simply for its beauty, a linear feature that cuts right towards Posso Bay. And then on the left hand side, you can see a multi beam image offshore of the trace of the Palu Coro Fault, which can be traced all the way across this profile. And of course, it was near to this section, although not on this section, where there was a major earthquake last year, which caused such devastation. So, this is a, a, an interesting area from a scientific point of view. And of course, that's what we see on land. There's the trace of the Palu uh, Coro Fault um, near to um, Palu here with these beautiful scarps, cut off these triangular scarps. There's a view to that iconic bridge crossing the bay in Posso. And there's what the bay uh, and the bridge looks like um, after that event in 2018. And there's the hotel I stayed in a couple of times. I'm fortunate that I wasn't there at that weekend. Um, associated with this, interestingly, is there is no volcanism in the North Arm which can be related to a subduction, as you might expect to see, because the 100 kilometer slab depth is roughly beneath the North Arm here. We might expect to see a chain of volcanoes along here. Interestingly, we don't. The only volcanoes we see in the East Arm are at the very eastern end, sorry, the North Arm, at the very eastern end. Um, which are related to a different subduction sea uh, over the Malacca Sea. We do, on the other hand, see one volcano, which is interesting and unusual in the middle of um, Gorontalo Bay. And in my view, this is magmatism, which is related to the extreme thinning of the crust in that area. And the product of some of that magmatism that's occurred in the central region of um, uh, Gorontalo Bay, and then on land in the Togian Islands, and also can be traced into the into Po head are these pyroclastics, which are now dated by both um, ages on micas from some of those between two and four million years old, and also by 
fossils in those sediments, which are reworked volcanic ash. On the other hand, we do see some magmatism if we go on land. Um, this is around the Palo Coro Fault, and I've simply shaded the areas of granites here. I'm not suggesting that all of these granite areas are related to um, extension, but I believe some of them certainly are. And here's one that, in my view, definitely is. This is crossing the neck. Now, I crossed the neck many times, and I remember when I first um, went there, um, specifically looking for granites in 2010, sorry, to start um, a new project in this area with Julianne Hennig, who did the work in this area. Um, this area was completely covered in vegetation and we found some granites and they were sticking out, but they weren't very impressive exposures. Um, in 2015, I went across this section again uh, for another project and there'd been making a new road cut and they'd cut back a section of a couple of kilometers in length and they'd cut it into this bare rock that we can see here and what we can see in front of us are granites which are very white here and this brown area which are metamorphic rocks and I must say I, I look at this photograph even now and I'm still stunned by it because in 2010 I didn't know the ages of these rocks in 2015 I did as a result of Julianne's work and we knew that these granites in here were three million years old. They were melts three million years ago when they were intruded. And they were exhumed incredibly rapidly. Uh, Julian's work um, using zircons and argon argon ages and some low temperature thermochron defines very closely the exhumation path of these rocks here. Um, they were exhumed extremely rapidly around three million years ago and they've been exhumed to the surface since then. And if you cut down this section a short distance where the road cut continued, you pass up into sediments, which in this case are alluvial fan sediments, which contain boulders of granite, which are the granites that you saw there, um, a short distance up section. And so this, um, these granites, which were three million years old, are overlain by alluvial fan conglomerates containing uh, boulder beds with granite in and then a little bit further along the section this is going um, a little bit further towards the coast we go stratigraphically higher we come into fluviatile sediments from which some fragments have been dated and these rocks were exhumed by about one million years ago these were at the surface um, being deposited about one million years ago so the granites that were three million years ago crisp uh, melts in the crust at some depth, at least two kilometers deep, probably significantly deeper than that, had reached the surface by about one and a half million years ago, a little bit less possibly, and they've been uplift and tilted, in this case, to elevations of about 550 meters since then. This is amazing, amazing at the speed of process that we can record in that region. And now I want to move back to Banda to um, deal essentially with the final section, which is what happens during rollback as it goes further? What's happened as we go further is that um, we extend, and in this case, we've extended so far that the continental crust has now broken and we formed, sorry, I keep touching the last button too carelessly there. Uh, we formed two ocean basins at different stages, the North Banda and the South Banda Sea. On Saram, we see uplift and exhumation of these metamorphic core complexes, not quite um, like Sulawesi, but very similar in many ways. We record melting of the very deep crust uh, and um, the, the famous ambonites and their cordurite granite counterparts are uh, melts of the deep continental crust. And we've actually exhumed the subcontinental lithospheric mantle. And at the final stages of extension, which continues today, which I'll finish with, is the Weber Deep. We know a great deal more about this region now as a result here. The areas that I've colored a little bit more strongly on this diagram, and the colors roughly correspond to depth. The purple colors are very deep, as I showed you. The North Band of the Sea is average depth of 4,800 meters. The Weber Deep over here is up to seven kilometers, well, more than seven kilometers in its central part. 
and we can see the major features in this case of the Saram trough going um, to the east over here and we can also unravel parts of the Sarong fault system in here. So this on land uh, information plus, sorry, the offshore bed information we've got plus what we're seeing on land has given us some really interesting insights into the development in places where we still can't date things in the ocean, uh, but where we can infer ages from what we can see on land. And we trace along here, and this was work um, uh, that was carried out mainly by Adi Patria um, as part of an MSC project. We can map now features uh, running along the trough north of Saram. And on land, uh, in particular, John Pownall has been working in Saram, studying in particular the metamorphic rocks and structures in that area. And we can see the, the way in which this region changes character as we go from west to east into the, um, uh, the um, Aru region. And we can also trace now with confidence where the Saram trough is and what its character is. And this is developed as a process of rollback, which I talked about earlier on. I've inverted the, the map of, um, of um, this collision zone, just to, um, not deliberately to confuse you, but so we can see this diagram on the right showing a profile of rollback. Um, and there's Australia to the south there, which is now at the top of my little image on the left-hand side. There's the Bander embayment, and there's the bird's head and the fragmented Sula spur, and the Bander sea is formed. So as we roll back between 12 and 7 million years, this rollback has led to what I can't show you in the upper plate, which I've taken off. So we can see the lower plate here is we see formation of a young ocean basin. We see stretching of the continental fragments and we see little fragments being left behind as this process develops. Now the Buru Basin, which is north of um, Buru and Saram, western end of Saram is the very deepest part and very often people draw the Saram trough into this area but we now know that this is not really the Saram trough in terms of its character. First of all it's much deeper and secondly it's very obviously um, formed by a series of steep normal faults on the north side which you can just see on this trace here these strong features which are running roughly east-west are these fault scarps here and uh, on the seismic lines, we can see these big normal faults um, enclosing the deepest narrow area, which in, in our view is probably filled with young ocean crust of similar age to that in the North Banda Sea. In other words, probably about 12 to 7 million years old. So that part is ocean crust, which is left over during extension that occurred during rollback. Now rollback continued further and the next stage of subduction after the North Banda Sea for some reason ceased spreading for a while. Continental crust was stretched out into the Banda ridges which are now south of the North Banda Sea and then a new ocean basin formed as the rollback continued and in this case it formed the South Banda Sea and we're now rolling back into collision almost with the Australian margin. We're beginning to see the Australian margin beginning to come into contact with the trench um, just north of Saram here, and we're leaving behind various fragments. There's some fragments in the fore arc, which you can just see here, which are still preserved in um, some of the outer arc islands and on Timor. And what we saw as we proceeded in this case is during this um, progressive rollback, which is a, a rollback at a distance of perhaps a thousand kilometers, roughly eastwards we've actually formed these core complexes initially, and then we've stretched to the point where um, we actually exhumed the mantle, and then we stretch even further and form these young ocean basins. Non Saram, we have partly a record of some of this extension, and uh, these aren't all the ages that John Powell uh, collected, that he recognized contacts between peridotites and granites, which are in, intrusive. The peridotite and the granite, formerly cordurite granite. These rocks here, this is a granulite, which records ultra high temperature metamorphism, about 900 degrees centigrade temperature, pressure uncertain. 
and we're getting ages of rocks within these areas um, which are less than five million years old um, in this fault zone here which is associated with the edge of the rolling back slab we've got um, mica schists which have got argon argon ages of just over three million years old um, we've got zircon ages in some of the cordurite granites in there of um, 5.5 million years old which confirms some of the earlier dutch ages um, uh, work um, acquired by dutch workers in the um, 1990s and some of the ambonites have actually got ages of 1.9 million years now that's interesting because what it means is that melting is still was still going on as recently as two million years below parts of Saram. there's john collecting some of the samples that he um, studied and these are some of the rocks they're really spectacular rocks garnet cordurite sillimanite spinel plagioclase bearing granulites this is one of the cordurite granites with these um, fragments of banded um, further granites and then the ambonites of course have got these famous garnet cordurite uh, xenocrysts and xenoliths of various spinel various sillimanite rocks and john's named this southern uh, major zone that cuts through the um, mountains of saram the kawashir zone um, it was clearly active at different stages um, it looks as though it's um, uh, been active uh, certainly since about 16 million years and then there appear to be a number of intervals I wonder if we were able to date more and more rocks whether we would find that there were um, intervals or whether we would find which is my instinct um, or whether we would find actually a record of more continuous exhumation as this um, proceeded but effectively what this represents is the northern boundary of the rolling back slab in the Banda region which is the region where the tear was that I showed on that diagram and here's the major structures in this region the Saram trough is a newcomer really in this whole scenario because probably during the period of major extension and rolling back from uh, the beginning of rollback which may be started around 16 million years ago judging by the ages we're getting in here um, or maybe a little earlier um, the shear the the Kawa shear zone was probably the active structure bounding the the trench that was forming and advancing and that trench has now advanced so the point is we see this boat slab this form of the boat as it were in this region and then the Weber deep so this in my view was the big tear when took us into eastern Indonesia and can be traced across this region and in fact in this region here once we get into the Aru region we're actually seeing extensional faulting and it's probable that extensional faulting was active while this slab was rolling back um, further to the west and here's a very simple very simple reconstruction illustrating the key features here um, the, what I call here the Saram Kumawa shear zone um, is the, the, um, the major boundary of the rolling back slab. The uh, slab rolling back was inducing extension in the upper plate over here, so we're forming the North Banda Sea, and at five million years we're beginning to extend to form the South Banda Sea. And we've left these Banda ridges here, which are fragments of continental crust that have been dragged out. And there's still some continental craft in the fore arc, which is colliding now with the outer arc islands down here. And those islands contain fragments of old crust. Now, how do we know the Saram trough is young? Well, one of the features that points to this is an area in the central area north of the trough itself, in which we can see very clear reef features once again. And this is a multi-beam image of the Saram trough, which is the deep part here. It's only 2,000 meters deep, which is very, very shallow um, for um, what is often inferred to be a trench, which is one of the reasons I don't believe it to be a trench. But it's now 2,000 meters deep. But to the north of that, these features that you can see here are very clearly um, reef features. You can see a reef edge there. I'm not going to spend time looking at these, but we can see we recognize these features now in many parts of the area. 
In other words, these reef edges here were at sea level when they were forming. And we know from seismic studies that these buildups of carbonates, which are illustrated in the top part of this seismic line here and in this feature here, on the right hand side, we actually can see multiple um, reef progradation, progradation, reef tops progradation, uh, which suggests that these reefs have subsided in increments, probably in a staccato like fashion, and they are built above a major unconformity which is dated as intrapliocene, probably about four million years old. So these reef features here were forming and they were at sea level when they formed less than four million years ago and they've now been bowed down into the surround trough um, and the tops of some of these features can be traced down into the trough and as we saw on that image uh, there these parts of the reefs are now down at water depths of around 1400 meters i think i've marked the depth on something i just marked it there um, the top reef features are still subsided below they're about 450 meters so that if you go across this section here what we're seeing is a gradual flexing of the early pliocene unconformity down into the trough and we're seeing the reefs above there. So at the present day, that rollback has continued to its present position. We're now uh, tracing it into the Weber Deep. GPS is telling us that relative motion between Saram and the bird's head is now very oblique, and that is very consistent. These modern motions are very consistent with the form of the Saram trough, which is broadly a strike slip zone in the western part and then turns to a segment which is almost orthogonal to the relative motion directions here. The bird's head is uh, aseismic and interestingly when you look at the seismicity unlike a trench which this is often said to be uh, normally associated with a trench is a lot of seismicity. In this case the seismicity is nearly all south of the trough it's actually on Saram and in the area close to Saram offshore. And we see that parts of, there's a significant amount of strike slip faulting, uh, sorry, thrust faulting, which is particularly the orientation of the thrusts over here. Uh, the thrusts themselves are striking roughly north south. And when we move around to the uh, central section of the trough here, the, the thrusts tend to be um, roughly. Um, oriented striking roughly north-south. We see a lot of strike slip faulting. We don't see much normal faulting, but over in the arrow trough today, we're seeing very active extension. Once again, in a convergent area, we're seeing extension. This shouldn't really come as a surprise. We now know where the Saram fold and thrust belt, as I like to call it, rather than uh, anything else because it's a, it, is, it was formed as a result, in a sense, of the collision between Saram and the Australian margin. This thrust front is on the west side of a feature here, which we call the Kai Arch, and the deep water area, and sometimes people trace the trough into this area because of its depth, is not bounded by a thrust, it's a normal fault. So once we get into this area, we see extension, and interestingly, it looks as though this extension has been going on for quite a while. It isn't, although it's active today, it isn't something that started relatively recently. It looks as though it probably started maybe 10 million years ago or possibly older. I wonder if some of these features might be reactivating old structures in the Australian margin. And if we go and trace a little bit further along, we can trace the Saram trough front, the thrust front between the Kai Islands. On the other side of the Kai Islands, we have this normal fault, which represents the edge of the Kai Arch. And interestingly, as we go south into the Tanimbar Trough, which is another place where we often see drawn a, a trench, we see evidence for these extensional structures, which can be traced down, which may well be very ancient structures. And what's the, what is interesting, I think, about this area, this is where the, the Saram thrust front would go, surround fold and thrust belt front would go. 
in this section here, there's a huge amount of mud volcanism, very visible. And in this section here, we've got what is effectively a gigantic mud flow, mass transport complex, which has flowed over the former uh, thrust front. And that's what we see on seismic lines. Now, if you saw this seismic line independently of anything else, many people would say that looks like a trench. It's not very deep, but it does look like a trench. This is a roughly, um, this section A is running not quite north-south. This section C is running roughly east-west. They both show this sort of imbricate structure uh, proceeding over a depressed um, surface of Australian crust, which is going down beneath it. But this is just another huge mass transport complex, which in this case is a couple of kilometers thick. And finally, almost the end now, uh, we come to the Weber Deep, this spectacular feature. And the Weber Deep seems to be a product of linking the big thrust, sorry, the big strike slip system running through Saram into what today is a young detachment which may well be active at the present day. This is, I do wonder whether this is, whether I'm right in saying this, but I believe this may well be the deepest. The, the, sorry, the largest normal fault anywhere on the earth. It's got about um, seven kilometers of offset uh, down to the deepest part of the Weber Deep. On this section here, on this profile here, which was uh, acquired um, courtesy of ION, um, we can see a section which has got an average 10 degree slope. So it's a very low angle surface. It's got five kilometers vertical at least vertical offset uh, along this area of 30 kilometers here the fold and thrust belt is further over so we're extending within the collision zone here and john has called this big extensional surface the band of detachment it seems to be an extensional feature that is developing within the former collision zone and it's a huge feature and it's got these mega slumps on the walls of this. This is the sort of thing we can only see with this multi-beam imagery, it's fantastic. Coming down here, now imagine if this thing slipped into this deep water area today, what would be the consequence? Almost certainly a tsunami. And in fact, we have records. Of course, this is the consequence of a tsunami that we saw recently in Eastern Indonesia. This is related to the uh, Palo Fault. Um, and interestingly, and, and worrying. in 1852, there was a devastating earthquake in this region. And 15 min minutes later, the earthquake was covered, um, was, was followed by a tsunami. Now, we can estimate from the time of arrival where that um, could have initiated. And it looks as though it's somewhere within that area that's confined here. This is work by John Powell and um, colleagues at ANU, Financio. Um, and they've inferred that this must be an area of um, somewhere where the um, uh, tsunami originated by some major failure. A slump, like I illustrated a few moments ago, of which there are others in the Weber Deep, is the sort of thing that could easily cause something of this sort. So this is something that we need to be thinking about and planning for. So I've come to an end. I'm sorry I've gone on for 90 minutes. Um, but um, I hope some of you are still awake. I'm just, I'm, I, I, in a sense, I've drawn attention to some of the points that I want to summarize uh, uh, and leave you with. Um, I think Eastern Indonesia is a really important region, which is unusual because we can't see what we can see in Eastern Indonesia anywhere else in the world. And we may be recording things that can only be seen in this region. One of the features that I think is important throughout the Western Pacific and in, in this region, we've got many small ocean basins. They're not like the Atlantic. So if we apply Atlantic stretching models and heat flow models and all that sort of thing in order to understand um, heat flow, sediment evolution and all the rest of it and um, other features, tectonic features, we're misleading ourselves. We should be taking observations in eastern eastern indonesia and transporting them to other parts of the world where these processes probably did occur but can't be seen any longer so they 
Eastern intuition records things that we can only see in this region where we're very fortunate. The continental fragments that we saw at the beginning, which I highlighted here and schematically shown here, are not the consequence of slicing and collision. So the bacon slicer model was a great idea. In my view, it doesn't work. These fragments are actually the product of extension. And this is the former Sula spur, which I've outlined here with this dashed line, roughly, which is now dispersed around the region. And this extension that we see, which is so important, has been driven by subduction, subduction rollback being very important. And we're seeing numerous areas around here in Sulawesi and Saram are just two of, of many of those areas where we're seeing dramatic extension driven by subduction. And really important, really important, is the fact that these processes are fast. They are faster than anything else you see anywhere on the globe. Um, I read a, an excellent review of core complexes a few years ago, um, which uh, was talking about rates of movement. And the rates of movement that they were inferring on both oceanic and continental core complexes were 10 times slower than what we're seeing here. Some of these core complexes are being exhumed almost in front of your eyes. In my view, the Posso complex, as I mentioned, could be exhumed in, um, uh, in two million years. And in fact, it's quite likely that that is still active today. Um, and these rates are dramatic. I, on the left-hand diagram here, you can see some uh, inferences drawn by Yulian Hennig on the um, Sulawesi complexes um, and their rates slightly earlier, also very steep for some older magmatic rocks. Saram, these are summary of diagrams of, of um, John Pownell, who's shown uh, different rates of exhumation of different parts of the region, very, very fast indeed. So we're exhuming the deep crust, we're exhuming the lithospheric mantle um, in a few million years at most. And of course, there is a real important social side to, the, to all of this, which we saw dramatically illustrated most recently in. Sulawesi and of course then Anak Krakatawa, um, where the impact of these events is really um, considerable. And we're never going to stop these things happening, but if we can uh, help people understand better what they can do, um, we can prepare for these hazards. And I think that is really an important role for geologists in the future, which to some extent we really have neglected a little bit, um, but now we've got the ability to find out where these things are going, we can start making better preparation and make sure we're performing a useful feature as well as just understanding the fascinating geology of this region. So Eastern Indonesia is important. We can see things that we can't see anywhere else. The new data are challenging many of our former interpretations and I expect that they will continue to challenge some of these interpretations as well. There's much to learn and we need new work. Subduction and extension are the most important processes in the neogene and have been important processes for a very long time. And in this region, we can see something which is often claimed to be impossible to see, which is the initiation of subduction. And we can also see the end of subduction. Rates are very fast. Activity continues today, and in my view, for those people who are watching that are a lot younger than me, um, you've got a great opportunity. Um, I wish that some of the uh, facilities that we now have had been available when I first started working out here in 1984, um, because we would have got on a bit faster. Um, so there's a great opportunity, and I still think at the bottom of all this, there, are need, there is a need for new field observations because what we're finding is that when we start dating these rocks and we start looking at them in a different way, we see different stories. So there's a great opportunity for you who are watching, I hope, who will take this up. So that's the end. In my view, as we've seen today, computers are a wonderful tool and we wouldn't be Zooming today if we didn't have them, but they're not the solution. 
they're a tool that we can use and we still need people to go out and look at rocks and then do all the things that we are now able to do in the lab with them and add to that our computer interpretations which will help us provide uh, uh, solutions but maybe uh, not without new observations thank you very much so thank you very I will much stop for the presentation such amazing very interesting and very insightful presentations uh, it's very complex uh, topic but you can deliver it in very simple way it's very interesting and uh, we know we can move to the discussions. Uh, there are already seven people want to uh, have a discussion with you. Uh, I hope the time is uh, available for this discussion. The first one is from your former student, Mas Ega. Uh, Mas Ega, you can uh, turn on your video and audio to ask directly to Robert Hall. Thank you. Hi, Robert. Oh, how are you? <laughs> have you got a beard? Yes, uh, because of this, uh, you know, COVID thing. So work from home, make uh, grow the beard. <laughs> We've still got that. I haven't got a beard. <laughs> uh, very enjoyable talk, Robert. As always, uh, really enjoyable. Um, and I really miss uh, our discussions in the field, especially in Sulawesi. Uh, there's a. Uh, I would say uh, uh, still a mystery for me that I want to ask uh, to you. And actually we had this discussion before in, in the field in Sulawesi. It's about the emplacement of the ophiolite. And you remember when we were in the field in Bonka River, we can find uh, lots of uh, garnet peridotite. And from the work from uh, Kandorusman mentioned that this garnet peridotite is related to the subductions and uh, he, uh, dated the the edge is about the, I think it's about the early Miocene. So I want to ask about your uh, idea or your interpretations, uh, the mechanism of this uh, of your life emplacement related to the uh, collisions that happened in the early Miocene and the extension uh, following after. Uh, well, okay, you've asked. Um as usual, uh, a difficult question. Um, <laughs> I, um, the, unfortunately, the field relationships of these um, garnet pridotites are um, very unclear um, because most of the fragments of uh, the garnet pridotites um, are found as float. They're beautiful rocks, but where they are from and exactly how they fit in is not entirely clear to me. Um, um, and the, the, the same in, in many ways is true of the emplacement of the ophiolite. We don't see, unfortunately, sections where the ophiolite rests on um, older rocks and we've got a metamorphic sole, such as maybe in a classic ophiolite, such as Sumail in the Oman where we can see these three-dimensional relationships much more clearly. And interestingly, even there, there's still a great deal of uncertainty about the processes that led to emplacement of an ophiolite, where you've practically got 100% exposure, and these rocks have now been studied for many years, and still there are arguments uh, revolving around when subduction occurred and how it's linked to the ophiolite emplacement, and when did it start, and They've got high pressure rocks there as well. I personally wonder whether these rocks, um, these garnet pridotites, are not um, subduction related, but are um, subcontinental uh, mantle lithosphere, which is in, potentially not related to the ophiolite. Um, and interestingly, we find similar rocks elsewhere which are not well dated um, but recently I've been working with some people in in Sabah who've been looking at guarding at prototypes there and have found that these are um, in their view and other people's views that, as well that have been published uh, uh, before um, the garnet prototypes represent um, subcontinental lithospheric mantle 
in Saram, for example, we've often heard that there are Ophelites on Saram. But in fact, John has shown us that, um, John Pownall has shown us that these um, uh, prototypes there are uh, much more typical of subcontinental mantle and we don't have the other parts of an Ophelite. Now, of course, in, in east, the east arm of Sulawesi, we do have an Ophelite. Um, mm. uh, we have a, um, a complete Ophelite there. Um, but I don't think that necessarily requires that the Garnet prototypes are um, the um, part of the Ophelite emplacement story. Um, what we would see if we emplace the Ophelite in, in um, Saram, uh, sorry, in Sulawesi, um, would be, as far as we can tell, and I must say the Ophelite is not particularly well dated, but the Ophelite itself um, appears to be Cretaceous in age. Yes. So um, we wouldn't expect to see one of these high temperature um, metamorphic souls there. Um, and I must say, I mean, you know this as well as I do, in the East Arm, um, access and exposure are still limited. Um, yes. And it's a real challenge to get to places where you can actually even sample these rocks, uh, let alone see their field relationships. So I, my own view is that I don't have an explanation for um, those garnet prototypes. Um, I have seen um, indications, um, Chris Parkinson uh, in his review paper um, some years ago, um, drew attention to um, the um, PT conditions under which they formed and they seem to be pretty deep in the mantle, wherever that was. Uh, we know that these extensional processes are leading to um, exhumation of um, deep mantle rocks in many places around the region now, very, very fast, of course, in East Indonesia. But I, um, I don't have um, an answer that I can say this is the way it worked. And I really don't know adequately how the um, East Sulawesi Ophiolite was explained. And in fact, I wonder whether that's one of those areas where we will still be wondering in another 50 years from now simply because yeah. of the difficulties of, of exposure. I mean, um, the, the section across the neck illustrated to me one thing. If you're fortunate enough to see a new section when they build a new road somewhere or something like that, sometimes you can answer some questions that wouldn't otherwise be answered. But you need to be there at the right time and you need to be there quickly um, because not only are these tectonic processes very fast, but unfortunately rates of weathering and erosion and vegetation growth are also pretty quick and uh, we lose the opportunity. So maybe somebody will build a new road in the future and we'll get some insights into the exposures of the, uh, and the origin of the Ophiolite more clearly. Mm. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Robert. So uh, okay. hopefully we can still uh, work on that as long as I And uh, I send my uh, manuscript to you, so hopefully I can get it. Okay, yes, I'm, <laughs> I'm taking it off on my list of things to do. <laughs> thanks very much, Robert. Uh, thanks very much for your uh, work and your uh, dedication to Indonesian uh, geology. Thanks uh, very it's much. good to see you again. Okay. Yeah, hope to see you in the future and go to the field again. Yeah, hope so. Who's coming? Is there somebody else coming next? Yes, uh, the second one is uh, from Pat David. Sorry, I just mute my audio. Uh, the second one is from Pat David. Uh, Pat David, you can uh, turn on your audio, please. Yeah. Good morning, Mr. Robert Hall. Good morning. Yeah, I would like to ask you about uh, the termination of uh, Palu Koro Fault. To the north is terminated at the subduction, Minasa subduction. So, uh, from this map, so uh, explain uh, if uh, 
Palu Korofor could be uh, extended to uh, Semporna Fault. Uh, Sabah. Uh, Semporna? Yes. No way. Um, let me see if I can um, share and my second question is, uh, And the second question is, Kawa and Komawa Fault train in Seram to Albert Head, is it the extended uh, trend of uh, Tasman line or not? Thank you. Um, okay, you've asked me two questions there. I'm going to see if I can find a slide. Um, interestingly, um, right now, I just wanted to show you one of the, yeah, this one will do. Um, um, we can see on this diagram here, if I move to, yeah, on the left-hand diagram, you can see the trace of the Palo Coro fault going northwards. It isn't so clear on this image where it goes. Now, this area in the very northeast of, um, sorry, the very northwest of um, the north arm and neck, um, it looks as though this area has developed in two stages. There's, although it's not particularly clear on this diagram, you can see a maybe a triangular wedge here, um, which is very different in character from this section behind it, which approaches the north arm. So it looks as though the, the, the um, this section has developed in stages, um, but there is no indication at all that this structure heads off towards Sabah. We don't have, um, we do have some multi-beam across the edge of the, what is effectively um, this peninsula here, um, which are, uh, unfortunately I haven't got the land area on there um, to show uh, clearly. Um, but this, the, the Palo Coro Fault does link up to the end of the trench here, although it's probably propagated through there in stages. Um, so my inference is that this part is the youngest part, maybe a couple of million years old at the corner, and it previously terminated about here. But I think that is very important. That, and in fact, uh, if we go into the Macassar Straits where people often draw faults that uh, cross the Macassar Straits into Borneo. Um, I have not seen any evidence for any of those faults uh, on any seismic line that I've had access to at all. So I believe the Palu Koro fault terminates at the end of the uh, trench, as we can see quite clearly on this multi beam image here, and that's it. Now, the other question you asked was to do with the um, Uh, what I call the um, Kawa and Komawa. Yes, this one here. This is the one you're talking about, isn't it? Can you see? Are you sharing? Can you see my share, my screen? Yes. Yes. And is can it, you see what? I, is it the uh, uh, Tasman line? Uh, this shear zone in my view, doesn't go any further than Aru. If there is a Tasman line in this area, um, where it is is not totally clear because it's overlain by um, uh, younger, many younger features. Um, it's somewhere, potentially somewhere in the bird's head. Yeah. Are you yeah potentially somewhere in the bird head yeah yeah i i mean i this is a an old structure um which i don't think has got any obvious link to the structures that we see here which were active during the neogene and in fact the arrow trough and tanimbar trough as i mentioned may be old um uh, elements that have been reactivated but if they are old elements, they're, re they're related more to, let's say, 
spreading that one stage formed the Banda embayment and formed the ocean crust that has now been subducted. Um, and they're re related to features that are within this part of the Australian margin. I don't see any obvious need or any obvious connection to the Tasman line at all. Okay. Any comment, Mas David? Okay, maybe uh, the the similar evidence of Tasman land is in the central range. So in the Merauke arc. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mas David. Uh, Dr. Puan is from Pak Suhakar, Eka Saputra. Pak Suhakar, you can ask to Robert Hall, please. Hello. Hello. Hello, Robert. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. Hello, Robert. How, how are you? you? Yeah. Uh, did you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Ah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for your presentation today. It's nice presentation. So I have two questions for you today. Yeah. Uh, the first question is related Eastern Indonesia. You know. You know. Uh, you you present about Eastern Indonesia, but I want to ask a little bit. Uh, is Father is is the Papua, yeah. Uh, which is the hub of uh, Birdberry, yeah. And uh, I'm gonna ask you about the mesozoic uh, tectonic in the Papua, yeah. Do you think the Tas Tasman line, as I saw in your some paper with hills, yeah, you draw a Tasman line, but it's not uh, direct to the Papua. Do you, do you think it's related to the Papua? Yeah. Uh, and the second question is about the Banda environment. How the impact of the Banda environment to the Nusa Tenggara? That's the two questions for me. Did you get it? Okay, the first question. Yep. I still think that the Tasman line, approximately where we drew it, um, mm -hmm. Kevin Hill and I, um, we turned the Tasman line towards the west and drew it into somewhere in the bird's head. Somewhere in the bird head. Uh, yeah, so it presumably, um, I don't see any easy way to, to really answer exactly where the Tasman line um, goes simply because, as you know, the bird's head is largely covered by sediments of much younger age. Um, and we do know a little bit more about the bird's head basement geology from recent work um, dating. We know there was a Triassic magmatism. We know there was Permian and Carboniferous yeah. magmatism in the bird's head and so on. Um, which makes sense in terms of there being an active margin there, which would be what you would expect if broadly the Tasman line turned westwards and that was the active margin. Where it then went, I don't know. Um, and wh where exactly it is, I don't think we can really answer simply because we don't see the basement um, adequately. Okay. On the second question, um, now you're just asking, let me just see if I can share my screen again. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and um, sorry, I was yeah, trying to. There we go. Yeah, I'm trying fine. to. Oh, sorry. <laughs> hard. To, um, I was just looking for a slide that showed. Um, the Banda embayment and where yeah. you were asking about sort of Nusa Tenggara area. Yes, um, yes, yeah. And um, I'm looking for a map that just see if I've got a map that showed just roughly where, yeah, this one is about as far as I go, isn't it? Okay, now um, in this one, you're at the eastern end of Nusa Tenggara down in this figure and the Ark Islands that are part of the Banda Ark, let's say Wetar um, and Alor, 
north of Timor, continue then into Flores and Sumbawa and so on. So once you get to the west of Sumba, you're now in a situation where there is relatively normal subduction of oceanic lithosphere at the Java Trench, which continues today. Um, and most of the extension and features that I've been talking about today um, are probably, they, they certainly affect the southeast arm of, of Sulawesi and we see features in Boney Bay that can be linked up to that. Um, then when you go a little bit further west um, at that sort of uh, latitude and further south, you're now into the area that is much less affected by what's been happening in the Banda region. So, um, I mean, I would look at Nusa Tenggara as relatively simple, relatively straightforward um, result of normal oceanic subduction. Mm. Does that answer your question? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But, uh, I mean, uh, some of your uh, paper, I see your paper is relative to the uh, dating, uranium dating, you, baby, you, you got some uh, result in the serum, but I didn't see in the forest yet. So, I'm still a uh, question is like a puzzle for me uh, about Nusa Tenggara relative to the Banda environment. But it's I don't, like school, yeah. I don't really see what connection you're making between Suram and Flores. Yeah, because there is, a, I mean, the present day tectonic environment, is this uh, related to the I mean, to the Flores because you, you know, one of the active tectonic in the Flores, particularly in the northern part of the Flores, there is the Flores big art and water. So, to, is there any relation for the rollback to the water trust or Flores trust here? Let me just see um, if this, right, this one. Yeah, you see now, um, if we take this situation, now obviously this is schematic and uh, simplified, um, but what we now see as part of Flores would be right in the southeast eastern corner of this area of that I coloured in yellow, which is trying to convey in a simple way the Sundar and Southeast Asia continent um, that existed um, at the beginning of the Miocene. Now at this stage, the Banda embayment is coming up and is part of the Australian plate. So they're on completely different plates at this stage. Now, if we go forward um, a few million years, let's go forward to 15 million years. Yep. Okay, now we're beginning to roll back into the Banda embayment. Oh, okay. Flores, um, and the islands of Nusa Tenggara would be roughly in this area in the Southeast Asia plate, whereas Saram is still within the Australian plate. Yeah. And then this tear is developing through Saram. And uh, as time goes on, that tear propagates across there. And I think, obviously, um, in fact, we've done uh, some work on the Sarong Fault Zone and, and we've got another reconstruction of this area, which is now better uh, than this one in terms of the things we've learned about the Sarong Fault Zone system and some of the development of the Saram Trough. So the some of the timing on this is, is um, a bit schematic. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, basically, Flores is developing now as an active arc within this area of extending Southeast Asia. So there's a little bit of an extension in this corner as you go further eastwards, but most of the extension is occurring in the Banda region. Um, but I don't really see any um, reason 
to do anything more than say, well, Flores is certainly an arc that develops in this area above the normally subducting oceanic crust. Mm. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you, Robert. Yeah. Okay. okay. Welcome. Thank you, Paswakar. Eh, Sukahar, sorry. Uh, the next one from Ibu Catur, Cahaya Ningsi. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Catur, Cahaya Ningsi, please. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Robert, for your presentation. I have two questions for you. The first is, uh, how you made the Southeast Asia risk construction model? Is there any approach or evidence for that model? And the second is how to generate sharp bathymetry image like you have present. Is it freely available data? Because uh, I saw this source from the uh, Geodata Ventures and TGS. Thank you. Okay, the, the first question, if I understood you correctly, was how did I make the reconstructions? Is that right? Was that right? How did I make the reconstructions? Yes. Okay, well, um, as you can imagine, there's quite a lot of um, work went into those, but essentially, um, when I first started, I started in a limited area, which was area of the Malacca Sea, because I was trying to understand the development of the Haumahira arc and um, how that interacted with the Sulawesi, um, North Sulawesi arc um, that links between uh, the Sangi arc, if you like, that goes between um, the um, east end of the North Arm into Mindanao, and um, how these fragments uh, got in there. So um, I gradually then reconstructed that small area, but in particular, the one that the feature that was important in the early work I did in reconstructing was based on our field work and paleomagnetic work that we carried out that was relevant to the development of the Philippine Sea and the Philippine Sea Plate. Um, and the Philippine Sea Plate was something that wasn't very well known, um, its history was poorly known, and that was because it's surrounded by subduction zones. Um, and we were able to collect paleomagnetic data from there, which told us where the different parts of the Philippine Sea Plate were at different stages and combined with um, the um, geology of the Philippine Sea Plate, what was known at that time, um, I developed a model for the Philippine Sea Plate and how that developed. So that added to my initial reconstruction in the Malacca Sea region. And then uh, essentially I added bits on um, of larger and larger areas and my own, I would, what I would say about the reconstruction is that my original aim is was to help me understand how the region had developed which I found very difficult to do based on published maps which didn't really show you how it went in stages one of the things about doing a reconstruction and trying to take geological evidence and then interpret it to, to say where fragments were, how they, when they collided, where there was a subduction zone, what age arcs were active and so on, means that um, you realise which bits of information work together and which don't. And, um, I was gradually trying to help myself understand how the region had developed. So in a sense, it grew um, bigger and bigger with time. And of course, what I, stud what I found, and I still find, is that there are many parts of the region where I didn't know much about the geology. Some of those areas we have visited and we've sought new evidence, and we now have better understanding. So it's an ongoing process. Um, which no doubt will continue into the future with as new evidence is acquired. And there are some things, as I pointed out today, that when I started in the region, um, for example, it was widely considered that the Banda Sea was Mesozoic crust. We now believe that is not the case, and we've got pretty good evidence that it's not the case, that the basins 
in that region are neogene. Now we weren't the first, I wasn't the first person to, to say that because I remember this. <laughs> I remember discussing this with Tony Barber um, and he said that's what we thought at the beginning but we were told by the geophysicists that it couldn't possibly be the case and it was Mesozoic. Well, turns out Tony Barber was right a long time ago um, and uh, these things are typical. I mean, as time goes on, we're going to find more about other parts of the region and those reconstructions are going to change. So all I would say is that they are a progressive, growing, um, continually growing and changing model, uh, which other people will no doubt improve in the future. So that's in a sense how you do it. The second question now, um, just remind me of what the second question was. Um, How to generate the shock photometry image? Ah, the, the maps. The multi, you're thinking about the multi-beam maps. Um, uh, let me just... Um, I think we may lose the share in a moment. Just, I'll stop the sharing. I'll share again. What you're inter interested in is, um, I'm just looking for a diagram that's got some of the multi, this, this sort of stuff. Uh, you're interested in where this information about the detailed bathymetry is. Yes. Correct. Is that right? Yeah, this one. Okay, uh, I'm in a fortunate position that I was allowed access to this by these companies that we've got listed here. Um, I understand that they were able to license this for a, um, a period of the, the government with these um, multi-client survey, uh, these various companies operated, they have different licensing conditions. And when their license runs out, I understood that this data reverts to the Indonesian government. Now, I don't know who manages it in Indonesia, but in Indonesia, but my understanding was, was that this information is held by the Indonesian government, whatever agency um, holds that, and it would be up to them to make it available to Indonesia researchers. I was fortunate that I was able to acquire the information and use it when those companies were able to license it under the conditions that they had their agreements uh, with. And I, I know that, for example, um, for example, after the Palo earthquake, I put a, sm a small image online um, on LinkedIn, I think it was, showing where the trace of the fault was offshore based on the multi-beam image. And this was TGS multi-beam data, and I contacted them um, to ask them if it was okay, and they said it was. And then I was contacted by several people, um, especially including several in groups in Indonesia, asking me where this information could be obtained. And I put them in touch with TGS, who were the company that at that time had the license. And I know that they shared the information with those researchers who were looking at the, um, the Palo Coro fault. Um, now, I, what I don't know is where this data goes in Indonesia afterwards. And all I can say is that I would encourage you to explore Indonesian authorities who might have um, access to it to find out how they can share it with you because I think it's something that would be really um, welcome in the public domain. Okay. Thank you for the... Okay. Yeah, thank you for the answer, Robert. Uh, next question from Pak Dana from Pertamina. Pak Dana, you can turn on your audio, please. Okay, thank you very much for the great presentation, Robert. Do you hear me? Yes, I'm hearing okay. you well. Okay, based on my observation from uh, field data and wells data in eastern part of what we call it Algolan, 
from South Sulawesi, North Bali, Lombok, and slightly shifting to Sumba in Southeast part, we can trace Upper Cretaceous to early tertiary or Paleocene volcanic evidence. And all of them have same volcanic activity during that time. Based on that, is it possible to interpret that the origin of Sumba Island is located northern part of its current position and moved to its current position due to the aerobic extension of the Banda region? Thank you. Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, I've, I've seen the uh, evidence on Sumba and um, to some extent in southeast Sulawesi um, of volcanic activity in the um, early Cenozoic. Um, and my impression is, yes, you're right, is that it is in some way, Sumba seems to have moved within the, uh, in a sense, the fore arc of the of the um, Southeast Asian continental region, as it were, during subduction. So during the rollback, it does seem to, there does seem to be some sort of linkage in, in Sumba. But I think um, my, my, my impression is, uh, from the evidence there is, is that Sumba broadly was part of Southeast Asia um, from at least the Cretaceous onwards, the late Cretaceous onwards. And you're right, so there was Paleocene, um, a Paleogene volcanism, certainly, um, Paleocene volcanism, perhaps. Um, I'm not, I think the dating is a bit, is potassium argon dating, and there's always some uncertainty about how precise that is, but broadly, certainly, early tertiary volcanism down there seems to make sense. And that would make sense if it was part of, um, a margin and certainly when the um, rollback started into the Banda embayment it looks to me as though potentially parts of Sumba have moved extended and uh, what the, uh, that's one of the areas I'd like to know a lot more about is the area of the uh, Flores Sea extending and continuing to the to the west towards the area north of Bali. Um, there isn't any multi-beam data there, there's, there's multi-beam data in, in uh, bony gulf but the bit that's really interesting which is or at least is especially interesting is further south of bony gulf um, going towards the the islands uh, from Bali, Lombok, um, Sumbawa etc and it would really be fantastic to have multi-beam imagery of um, the seabed there because I think that is puzzling how much extension is there in there when did it occur um, so many of these areas are really still poorly known, which is what I was trying to point out really. There's a great need, and when I say field work, I really mean, in a sense, new observations that look at geological data. And I include seismic data and things like that within that, of course, is that they're all useful parts of information. And uh, it's um, getting better dating, so we know the timing of things, the multi-beam gives you really new insights into the structures of those regions about which we know practically nothing along the way. And so I think at the moment we just don't have the knowledge to really give you a very detailed um, presentation of um, you know, what exactly has been happening. That's the best I can do for something like that, I'm afraid. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, next question from Pak Abraham. Pak yeah. Abraham, you can turn on your device. Bapak Abraham. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Professor. How are you? Good morning. Oh, good afternoon. Oh, good yeah. afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon, Professor. I am Abraham from College of Meteorology, Climatology, and Geophysics. Bird 2003 mentioned that from GPS observation on Bia Island, the factor towards Bia area, there is a trough with east-west direction. Was the trough due to a transform fault or formed by subducting of Caroline Plate, a uh, southwest Pacific Plate Park? I lost a bit of sound in the middle of that. Which island were you talking about? Did you mention? 
uh, Bia Island. Which one? Pro- Bia, Bia Island Bia. in Papua. Bia? Yeah, not, yes, Bia Island. Oh, Bia. Okay, yeah, now that is a, a bit complicated up there, isn't it? Um, the, um, let me see if I can... In the early slide. Oh. Yeah, okay, I'll try and share this again. Um, and um, there was a GPS map in the end. Oh, this I one. Think upward, Mister. This one, Professor. I'm sorry. Um, that one. Can you see that map I'm, I've got now? Uh, where it shows from. From Perth, two thousand and two thousand and three. Yeah, this one. It's got Bob. Oh, yeah, maybe in this one. But yeah. in uh, the Perth two thousand and three mentioned that the direction to the west. Uh, what I know about this area is that there are. Oh, uh, this is yeah. The, uh, the yeah, island is the row with. In the like B, Cendrawasi B. Yes, I can see it. Can you see my map yeah. here? Yes. Um, w- what I know about that region is that there are more recent um, observations in this region, although uh, there aren't really, um, they haven't really been published uh, very fully. And what they seem to show is that there are an awful lot of local movements in this area which are not. Um, consistent. If we go to, for example, um, uh, first of all, we, if you go into um, what I've labelled here oh, as New Guinea, which is Papua New Guinea and Papua, um, there are very few locations where these measurements are being made and they're not all consistent. And I have the impression that the area, particularly around Biak, Yapin, um, Manakwari and around Chendrawasi Bay um, are actually there's a lot more local movements that are not entirely consistent and there's a quite a complicated pattern of faulting um, for example there's obviously a big strike slip fault on the north side of Yappen running roughly east-west and then down the west side of Chendrawasi Bay we have Ransiki and, and, and the, the various um, faults along there that are not very well described offshore um, and it it is still a puzzling area so I and it, this is another area where for example the area that's shown on there is Manak Wari Trough in the New Guinea Trench in, it, yeah. it would be fantastic if we had really detailed bathymetry in those areas from for example multi-beam surveys and so on um, this area is very complicated and very difficult to unravel in detail. And um, there's a great lack of information again. And so the one thing I do think is important about these GPS measurements is what they're telling you is what's happening now. You can't use them to infer in many areas, particularly in this area of Eastern Indonesia, what happened even possibly a million years ago. Things might have been different. And I certainly wouldn't go back much more than that. So they're telling us what happens now, as is the seismicity. But they don't tell us a great deal about the history of this region. And also, because the number of stations is still relatively small, we have a very limited picture of what are the features of this region. For example, I know that this diagram uh, is just a, uh, an attempt at um showing where people have drawn what they call a bird's head block now um i've seen work more recently that actually shows that palmahira and the bird's head block are essentially moving together at the present day and as you can see even from this diagram once you go to chendrawasi bay and the islands of yapan and biak they certainly don't seem to be moving in the same way as the rest of the bird's head, which is practically stationary. So there's a lot of complexity in there that we don't understand.
And I honestly, I can't tell you about the history of that um, in any more detail. Okay, thank you, Professor. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. We have two more questioner for the last question. Uh, from the next one from Pak Musri. Yeah, Pak Musri, you can turn on your audio. Ah, still in. Ah, the, still yeah, in. I can see you now. Still in mute. Can you can you turn on your audio? It's still in mute. My oh, is it? No, no, no. My audio my my audio is still shown as being on. Oh, I mean, I cannot hear Pak Musri. Okay. Voice. Ah, okay, thank you. No, no, ah, Musri. Ah. Hi, Robert. Remember oh, hi me? there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. More than seven years ago, we, we worked together in uh, Southeast Sulawesi. Yep. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm interested about uh, band extension uh, 12 uh, MA and 7 MA. This is uh, interesting for me because I have uh, data from uh, uh, petrology, metamorphic petrology in the Southeast. Also, uh, I can compare uh, the same uh, data. Also, I found uh, 12 uh, MA and uh, 6.8 meganom uh, extension data from uh, metamorphic petrol in the southeast uh, arm of Sulawesi. So, maybe you have comment about that because I don't know how the relation with uh, banda extension and the uh, petrol data from metamorphic petrol metamorphic rock in the southeast uh, Sulawesi. Uh, the second question, uh, uh, what, uh, maybe do you have idea about, um, uh, because this is a band extension very dynamic, uh, maybe you have uh, idea about uh, geological disaster, uh, uh, especially about tectonic uh, disaster in the southern part of Sulawesi or in the is Indonesia for the next? We don't know. Oh, oh maybe you have an uh, interpretation. Um, okay, um, both of those questions are very interesting. It's an area I'd like to know more about. You mentioned some age data from the metamorphic rocks. I've been waiting for the um, for somebody like you to produce <laughs> some age data that I could see because I remember you went to ANU and yes. didn't you do dating with Marnie? Marnie yes, Foss? Yes. So when are you going to publish those dates? Yes, until they have <laughs> not finished. I, it's difficult. It, it is difficult for yes. me when you yes. tell me those yes, ages yes, to yes. say uh, uh, what they mean. But I actually have been very interested. I expected that there would be evidence of extension in that region during the Neogene. And part of that reason for that was some work we did on bony uh, using yeah. multi-beam and seismic. And there is a paper by, um, if you send me an email, yeah. I will send you a paper by David Camplin okay. and Thank me you. that talks a bit about bony golf and offshore. And also Egger is yeah. somebody that you should discuss with because he also did work in Sulawesi on the sediments, as you know. Yeah. And um, he also thought that there was some, he had a nice cross section going across the Southeast arm that interpreted some of the things we see in Boney Gulf linked up to what we saw down in Southeast Sulawesi and Bhutan area and so on. And um, so as far as your ages are concerned, it, they don't surprise me that you get some young ages, but I'd like to know what they are. <laughs> yes. Secondly, in tectonic terms, I definitely agree um, with Egger um, that, that there has been, that part of Sulawesi is likely to be um, disturbed, tectonically affected by extension in the Banda region. And for example, Bhutan is one of those areas that I always used to think was incredibly puzzling until we had a, this sort of rollback story because one of the odd things about Bhutan was that it looks as though early in the Neogene, the Ophiolites were in place, which would mean that everything 
becomes terrestrial and you get emergent and so on. And then suddenly, later on in the Neogene, you find it's depositing turbidites and there are deep water sediments in, in the region. The Dutch did some papers on, on the details of the stratigraphy down there showing that the area subsided and then it comes up again. Well, in a normal tectonic model, that's difficult to understand. But in terms of a rollback model, it makes a lot more sense because you can see why um, things, as you're extending, why things subside and also as they uh, come up again. So I don't, I can't give you an explanation of what's going on in Southeast Sulawesi, but I do think, like Ega, that extension has played a, an important part in that, in the, within the Neogene. And it would be very useful to have some ages uh, from the metamorphic rocks down there. So we knew a bit more about exactly when that was happening. So over to you for getting some publication with the age data, please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mas Ricky, where's Mas Ricky? I think we still have one more question and this one, this will be uh, the last question from Pak Wahyudi. Yeah, we still, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I just needed my audio. <laughs> okay. Thank yeah. you, Melinda and Ricky. Uh, thank you, Robert. How are you? Finally, I'm, I can see you. I'm, I'm good. I'm, my throat's a bit dry. <laughs> okay. Uh, at the beginning of your your, your talk, that you mentioned that uh, some researcher, uh, at least uh, McKenzie, in uh, 1977, and also Heria, 2010, uh, they said that there is a major problem in plate tectonic, especially how how to identify the initiation of the subduction. And uh, there, there are at least 14 hypothetical explanations and commented uh, that uh, how to investigate the subduction initiation by observation is uh, uh, because of the, the, the absence of the de definite knowledge about the localities where the subduction uh, starts, possibly starts. Yeah. Uh, today, after uh, joining with, with, with your talk and uh, that you have delivered the, the great presentations, uh, such uh, you have explained about this problem is, is clear for me. But uh, I have a question, just actually uh, similar with the, the previous uh, question about the, the laser suna. Especially the what is happening in the back side of Flores and Metar, you know that the almost all of the seismic activities uh, occurring in the back side of Flores. Yes. Uh, yes. You said that uh, it is obviously that the straightforward subduction in the shortened from the oceanic crust, but uh, in fact. Uh, the, the seascape, the, the the I mean the bathymetry of the the uh, back ah basin of the Flores is uh, totally different with with the bathymetry of the Java Sea in the back ah of the from the Bali Sea to to the westward. In the Flores uh, Sea, there is a I, I think more than five thousand meter depth. And also, as I have said before, that uh, almost of the seismic activity is occurring because of the back uh, trust. So my question is, uh, could what is happening in the forest trust now be the initiation of the of the new subduction? Thank you. Okay. You raise um, some really interesting questions there because you're quite right. I mean, if you just go from the Java Sea eastwards, there's clearly something very different. The Java Sea is very shallow. Um, and then you cross the area to the north of um, Bali and Lombok and uh, it starts to become deeper. And then 
as you go further east, um, it looks, as you say, I mean, I don't know the exact depths in that area. Um, and, um, but it certainly is a lot deeper and it's also a lot more varied. It looks as though it's potentially blocky and uh, some bits are elevated. We practically know nothing about that area. Um, the bathymetry is, at the moment, the only bathymetric information I have is basically from the sort of global models, which give us a pretty rough picture, but not a detailed picture. Um, you're also right that there is something interesting going along from Bali, on the north side of Bali and Flores, um, because it does look as though, and especially recent earthquakes, suggest that there's um, back arc thrusting, uh, northward directed thrusting um, going along there. Um, now, there are two comments I've got on that. One is that it, this isn't the first time that people have said, oh, could this be subduction polarity reversal? Could we be initiating subduction in that area? I don't personally think that is very likely. And the reason I don't think it's likely is because there just isn't enough oceanic crust, even if there is some oceanic crust there, there just isn't enough there to really start a subduction system going. Um, you know, it's too narrow. And so, although it's starting to thrust, um, I don't believe it's a polarity reversal uh, taking place. <laughs> On the other hand, it's very interesting to ask why is there thrusting there? Because you would expect that um, since the Java Trench is the place where oceanic crust is going down, it doesn't need to um, have any internal deformation within the upper plate because it's all being thrust underneath. Now, what we see in the history in Java, the history of Java um, is interesting because it does look as though in Java, the subduction zone at different times has locked. And so in Java, for example, we have some major thrusting um, in the late Miocene um, in North Java, um, which seems to be related to the fact that something arrived at the trench and blocked it. And maybe that prevented subduction. And so you then start deforming the upper plate for a brief interval, and then subduction resumes normally. So for some reason, it looks as though we're in one of those intermittent phases now, I, I did say that, in my view, the most common state for a, sub, a, a four arc to be in during subduction is extension. But nonetheless, there are still intervals of contraction and they may be related to locking of the subduction zone for short periods of time. They may be arrival of, of, of objects on the, the plate um, at the subduction zone, which blocks it, which then causes requires you to have deformation within the upper plate, such as we're seeing behind Bali and Flores. But I think what you've highlighted is actually, this is, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have a campaign of multi-beam mapping throughout Indonesia and try to solve some of these tectonic problems. And also, obviously, if there was some dredging um, even if not drilling, we might know more about the ages of the rocks in those areas and so on. So I, I agree that in many ways there are some considerable puzzles going from Java to um, the Lesser Sunda Islands and the area behind them, and you're right to focus on the deformation in that area. Um, and at the moment, we still don't have enough information to really um, understand why these things are happening. So I hope that helps a little bit. Any comment, Awayudi? Yeah. Any comment? It's okay. It's okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, oh. Robert. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. You're welcome, and thank you um, to um, FOSI for organising this, and um, for all of those people that actually <laughs> stayed online. And for all I know, they're all asleep now. But um, no, no, no. It's late in the day for you, isn't it now? So it's probably bedtime coming soon. Can we can we turn on our, our, our video so Robert can see all of us?
<laughs> I can I can see. Nobody will be very happy to see all of us. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I can see a lot of different faces. Oh, there's Awang. Hello, Awang. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Afif. Robert. Oh, there's Afif sitting next to you. Now, interesting. Hi, Robert. Hi Thank there. You. How are you? Uh, there's Herman. I know, there's a lot of people I know here. Um, they all come up in alphabetical order, and uh, so I've got all the A's for a moment. But uh, <laughs> what that shows you is that it's better if you have a name beginning with A, because then you'll appear on the screen. Because <laughs> if your name begins with yeah, you're I'm, right. <laughs> I'm R, my name is, begins with R. So normally I would be down at the bottom, but today I'm fortunate I'm at the top. So thank you very much for coming to this meeting and uh, I've enjoyed um, doing it even though my throat is now becoming a little bit dry. <laughs> oh Matt, hi there Matt, how are you? Okay. I can see, I don't know if I, can, oh I can see, I can flick onto the next screen and see if the, who else yeah. I know. You can scroll. You can scroll, yeah. Uh, <laughs> scroll to the, 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 the right. <laughs> Was Afif also here? Yeah. Afif, I didn't see you. Where were you? Is Afif here? I should be on, on the first. Cause are you on the first page now? Yeah, right? yeah. Oh, there you are. I saw Afif. Yeah, I saw you. <laughs> I saw you a moment ago. Yeah. You tried to hide. Nice to see you, Robert. Yeah, well, it's good to see all of you. And um, even, I must say, I think you ought to persuade Edgar to um, um, shave his beard and moustache. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. <laughs> uh, I think but, it's a uh, new style. <laughs> yeah, well, um, <laughs> to make it but also, to make it so, um, it is wonderful that you have had this program going and you're doing such a good job on keeping everybody in contact. And uh, uh, I mean, all I've tried to highlight today is how much there is still to discover. And um, I just hope that it won't be too long before this virus is under control and we can um, get back to um, doing some of the work that's needed mm, yes hopefully hopefully okay to so close this sessions totally to the time limit so thank you very much Robert, for your precious finish this very interesting very expensive thank you robert thank you very much i think you have a very good dedications and I hope you can have a good retirement day. So stay safe and yeah, keep connected. Okay, well, good luck, everybody. Thanks for coming. You too. Yeah. Thanks. Great yeah. to see you all. Thanks, Thanks so much.